Good morning. Welcome to Riverview Church. Let's stand up and worship our Lord together.
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever we live for you, we live for you, holy. song. It's such a prayer.
God is alive. Amen, church. So good to have you here. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. What an amazing song. Thanks for singing out. We're going to dismiss our kids and our junior hires and their senior hires to their classes. Before you see it, turn around and greet somebody. We're a friendly church. Say hi to somebody. Jay and Helen to come up, the family. We're going to dedicate this beautiful little girl, Sarah Noel Marsh, to the Lord, and uh, come up the steps here so no one trips or falls. All right. Look at all this. These kids. Fantastic. Come in front of the podium right here. Can we welcome them? Yeah, well, let's welcome the Marshes. Welcome, you guys. So as you know, the, as we do ch child dedications here, this is really the family just saying, Lord, thank you for this amazing gift, and we dedicate this child back to you, that you would make an impact in this world for Jesus Christ. And also Jay and Helen dedicating themselves as parents to raise Sarah and all these kids in a home that puts Christ at the very center. Can I hold her? Can I try? All right. Wow. We have your screen. Look at her. Now, she's actually a foster child that they adopted. So isn't she beautiful? I gotta take I gotta take her down a little bit. Isn't this nice? Look at her. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Man, we're gonna take you home with us. Mom, my wife and I. Wow. I know it even seven, right? A great number seven. Well, as you know, these lives are all miracles. And uh, let me come back up, up here. And uh, we are so thankful that uh, as a church, we have so many people here are working with our kids. We believe in having a, a dynamic children's ministry that helps do our part as a church to raise them to love the Lord. But we know parents have to do something as well. They have their children most of the week. And my verse for you, little girl, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Yes. <laughs> She's like, who in the world are you? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. She's really listening to me better than you guys do on Sunday morning. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's my prayer for you. And uh, Sarah is a name that means princess in the Hebrew. As you know, Abraham's wife was named Sarah. And so we want to dedicate Helen and Jay and this entire family, but especially Sarah to the Lord this morning. And uh, let's do that right now, okay? Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to dedicate this little girl to you. Thank you for Sarah and this amazing life and the potential that she represents. Lord, I pray that she would trust in you and that she would not lean on her own understanding, but follow you in everything that she does and that you would allow her life to have an amazing impact in this world. Be with Helen and Jay as parents as they raise all of these children in a home that puts you at the very center. Give them strength and wisdom. We know parenting is not easy, but we commit them to you as well. And we dedicate this little Sarah to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here you go. Wow. And I have this little certificate for you. Can you carry that, you think? Great job. All right, let's give them a hand again. Thank you so much. Amen. All right, can you make it all right, right down this way? There you go. Perfect. Or you want to do announcements? Okay, we'll have you do announcements. Well, if you're seeing the seat closest to the center aisle, would you take out our friendship register? That's our little black book like this. Uh, that's our way of hearing from you. Thank you for being here today. If you're a first-time visitor, we love having you here. We hope you feel the love of God in this place. We welcome you. There's a coffee mug for you at the information counter on the patio, a Riverview Church coffee mug, so pick that up on your way out. And uh, please sign the friendship register. If you have any prayer requests, share those at the bottom of the friendship register. Uh, we love praying for you. Thank you for sharing them with us. John Dunkel is our uh, church admin pastor, and he's doing our announcements today via video. So let's watch that. Good morning, Riverview. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is John Dunkel, and I'm the admin pastor here at Riverview. And at this time, I'd like to go over with you some of the upcoming ministry opportunities and events here at Riverview. Hey Riverview, we have Loft House build number 73 coming up on September 28th in the back parking lot. So grab your DeWalt laser level and your Benford 3000 impact drill and come out and join us. Our mom life ministry here needs some volunteer workers in the child care area. These are paid positions and are typically every other Thursday. Check out the bulletin for details. Riverview. There are several sign-up opportunities on the patio today. The first one I want to mention is the Tuesday Women's Bible Study. It will be starting September 24th and there will be both AM and PM sessions. Hey, there's a sausage making class on Saturday, September 28th. And it's open to everybody. Come join Greg Mangus as he weaves a spiritual message into the art of sausage making. <laughs> Next, we have Riverview Roots, who will be meeting on September 29th. This is for your first through fifth graders and is a great opportunity for fun and fellowship for these kids while they get to know more about Jesus. Women, in November there will be a women's retreat in nearby convenient Murrieta. This will never nevertheless be a wonderful time of fellowship and spiritual renewal. Finally, Riverview, we have a couple save the dates. First, there's the Unbelievable Conference up at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. Justin Briarley, who spoke at our church earlier this summer, is going to be hosting it. Come and learn how to express your faith to your skeptical friends who need to hear. Secondly, on October 19th, uh, we have the Harvest Festival here at Riverview Church. This is always a highlight of the fall, and I hope you're planning to attend. Well, Riverview, that's about it. Whether you're watching online or you're here live, thanks for tuning in. Have a great day and week in the Lord. Amen.
Amen. Thanks, John. And uh, yeah. So, uh, ladies, uh, if you, I want to say more about the Tuesday study. That's this Tuesday. He said the 24th. Sometimes you don't realize, oh, that's actually two days away. So, 9.30 a.m., child care in the morning session. And then the evening session is here at church as well. There isn't child care, but it's here at church. There are close to probably now over 80 ladies that have signed up for this Bible study. So, ladies, if you want to get connected, feel more like you know uh, some more folks here at Riverview Church, this is a great way to do it. Sign up today. You can pick up your book. They've come in. Uh, sign up today on the patio. And we have the women's retreat coming up. That's coming up in November. So we have to get our numbers in to the retreat location well ahead of time. So please sign up for that. It's going to be a, an amazing retreat. So we love our ladies. Sign up for those things. I'm going to ask Bill, one of our uh, elders, to come and pray for our offering. You can have the ushers come forward for the offering. Uh, you see in your bulletin this week, our missionaries are Greg and Christina Miller. They're in a little country called Ma I think you say it. Maui. Malawi. 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 Thank Malawi. you. <laughs> My son went there, but uh, he went to an orphanage there to, to serve. And this couple is serving. He is a uh, seminary professor, and she is in the medical field looking at the hospital there. Great combination. Let's remember them in prayer now. Father, we thank you for this couple who have dedicated their lives to serving you.
before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind.
Oh, the amazing, reckless love of God. Amen, church? Amen. Jesus told the story about the good shepherd. He had 100 sheep. One was lost. He left the 99. Sounds reckless to us, but that's just the way God loves us. He's after us. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He's an awesome God. And with that in mind, let's talk to him right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and sing praises to you. You are an awesome God. Thank you for the way you describe your love to us, that you would leave the 99 to follow, find the one lost sheep, that you run to your prodigal son that is walking back to you, that you demonstrated your love to us by dying on a cross for us. Lord Jesus, we love you. As we open up your word, May our hearts be ready to receive it today. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in a series entitled Questions by Jesus. And last week we began uh, this kind of two-week mini-series entitled What is Written in the Law? And uh, we had a little bit of a technical problem, so we're actually running the PowerPoint from the back. Thank you for doing that. You did a great job last couple services, so thank you. What's written in the law? And the, the question is found in Luke chapter 10. We talked about it briefly. Let's open our Bibles there to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Jesus encounters a lawyer who asks Jesus the most important question that anyone can ever ask. The most important. No, it's not on your SAT tests or ACT tests. It's, it's a question that talks about eternal life says this, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, we, we, we talked about this last week. Could Jesus have answered that question on his own? Absolutely he could have. He's the living Logos of God. Remember John 1, 1? In the beginning was the word Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He's the living word of God. All authority. Like what uh, some of the temple guards came, said when they came back from hearing Jesus, they said no one ever spoke like this man. Like he spoke like he had authority. He had the answers. But what he did was model for us exactly what we should do. When we face questions in our life, the important questions of our lives, where do we turn for answers? To the word of God. Jesus said to this lawyer, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. You're right. The answer to that question is found in the word of God. My prayer would be all of us would have a confidence in the word of God like Jesus had. And that we could defend that. Right? I, 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 if I asked you today, do you believe Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? You would probably say, yes, I do. Do you believe the Bible has absolute truth in it? Yes, I do. Then if I asked you, why do you believe that? What would you say? Somebody in the first service uh, just yelled out, because I believe it. Well, I said, you know, that's great that you believe it. But for example, the Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God. Does that make it true? Uh, another person might say, well, I have faith. Well, Muslims have faith that the word of God is in the Quran. Does that make it true? No, it doesn't. What we want to do is analyze the evidence that supports this amazing claim that the Bible is the word of God. Unlike any other book that's ever been written, that's ever been pulled together, that you'd be able to give the answers to that question, if I asked you why, you would say, the reason why I believe it is because of the incredible manuscript evidence behind it, the archaeological findings that prove the Bible to be amazingly accurate, the prophecies in the Bible that come true one after another, and there are many other reasons beyond that, but that you would have reasons so that your step of faith would be a small step of faith to believe the Bible is the Word of God, just like creation, right? I spoke at uh, FCA this week and Carlsbad High School where my son leads the group and there's about 70 80 high school kids there this FCA group and I talked about that the the 
creation all around us with God's fingerprints all around us. I even brought in, right before I went in, I picked a leaf off a tree and I picked up a blade of grass. I told them not to tell the Carlsbad administration that I had done that. But I brought in this leaf and I looked at it. I didn't realize that as I picked it off, it was a beautiful leaf. It had this kind of waxy feel to it that made it feel fake even. It was so beautiful. And I actually, when I walked in, I said to this girl sitting up front, I brought in a leaf from uh, your campus today, could you verify that this is a real leaf? And she looked at it and said, no, it's not. She thought it was fake. That's how beautiful it was. And I said, actually, I just picked it off a tree. It is a real leaf. Is this a real blade of grass? Yes, it is. And I explained to them, like I, I explained to you, that scientists and all their wisdom and all their power have not been able to create a blade of grass or a leaf from a tree Yet they tell us that all of this came about by some accidental, non-directed force. That's a huge leap of faith to believe that. Huge leap. Even scientists with all their intelligence trying to make it, they can't do it. And we're told that it all happened by accident? Impossible. Impossible. That is a massive jump of faith to believe that. I like what Norman Geisler uh, titled one of his last books before he passed away. An amazing apologist. His title of his book was, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It takes a massive amount of faith to believe that. And when it comes to the Word of God, I want you to know, yeah, it's going to take a step of faith, but it's a small step of faith to believe that this book came about by a divine intervention in the process to produce this amazing work that you hold in your hands. 1 Peter 3 says this, always being prepared to make a defense. We should know these things. We should be able to give people reasons for why we believe this is the word of God more than just saying because I have faith, because I believe it. Here are the reasons. How often should we, we, we be prepared? How often? Always. Always being prepared to make a defense. The word there in the Greek is apologia. It's where we get the English word apologetics from. It means to be able to defend what you believe to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it, I love this, with gentleness and respect. We're not getting into loud yelling arguments with people. We do it with gentleness and respect. But Jesus, in this passage in Luke chapter 10, has an amazing total confidence in the word of God. That was the first point last week. Jesus had a total confidence in the word of God. He said that not one iota, not one dot would pass away until all is fulfilled. He talked about how the Old Testament talked about him and everything would come to pass that was promised or prophesied about in the Old Testament. The apostles, we talked about this last week, also had a total confidence in their writings being Holy Scripture, inspired by God. Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed. Peter talked about Paul's writings with the other scriptures. The apostles saw themselves as having equal status to the prophets of the Old Testament that wrote the 39 books of the Old Testament. And if someone says to you, well, how could these writers of the New Testament ever remember what Jesus said? They wrote these books 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus died on the cross and ascended. How could they ever remember that? Do you remember the verse we talked about last week? What verse was it? John 14, 26, right? John 14, 26 says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, this is Jesus talking, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you how many things? All things. And bring to your, your remembrance all that I have said to you. Not some, all that I've said to you. So when they wrote, they were definitely having divine help, divine inspiration to write the New Testament. We should never doubt their ability to remember what Jesus said and what he taught. See, the evidence, I believe, supports the fact that we should have total confidence in the Word of God. That we should have total confidence in the book that we hold in our hands as being absolutely unique in all of history. No other book comes close to it. The Bible with its 39 book, uh, 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, totaling the entire Bible, was written over 1,600 years 
was written in three different languages in three continents. The three languages were Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek with 40 authors writing this amazing work that we hold in our hands. I don't know if you're like me, but I've read many books that have been revised and redacted and changed. Why? Because the one author wrote in one book and yet contradicted him or herself. So it had to be changed. It had to be redacted. It had to be revised. Think of this. 40 different authors, yet it gives one consistent message throughout over 1,600 years of writing. One consistent message culminating in the coming of Jesus Christ and the writing of the book of Revelation by John talking about the end times and what's going to happen. It's an amazing book that no human force could have produced on its own but must have had divine intervention. You know, and yes, there was councils uh, throughout the early church like the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD where church leaders met together to address a growing problem in the church and that was false teaching. Jesus prophesied about that. He said beware of wolves in sheep clothing, right? That will come into the church and attack the church with false teaching. That was happening. There was a teaching called Arianism, for example, that was confronted in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. It taught that Jesus was a created being. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Word of God says. So they confronted it in this council and said it's heresy. It doesn't match what the Bible says. The Council of Carthage in the early 400s, which basically stopped anything from coming into the Bible that shouldn't be there. As you know, there was early acceptance of the writings of Peter and Paul and of the Gospels in the early church. And then all of a sudden, about 300 AD, all of these false Gospels started to show up. I think I talked about last week, how if I was going to write a gospel about the life of Jesus, if I called it the gospel of Melvin, no one would read it, amen? You wouldn't read it. But, hey, if I write this book with the name of Thomas, the disciple, because there isn't a gospel by Thomas, but I'll use his name and call it the gospel of Thomas, even though I'm writing it 150, 200 years after Thomas died, maybe it will be accepted. That's exactly what was happening. False gospels were being written, and the church said, no, we're not going to allow these things into the Bible. That's, that's not an accepted book in the early church. We want to keep those things out. This past week, my wife texted me a photo. I was at a meeting in, in the evening, and she texted me this photo of our, what was happening right outside our front door to our house. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. You can see what was happening was this. A snake had crawled up behind the outside of our house. And it was crawling up underneath the wall behind, at the front door of our house. And she texted me, she's like, why do these things always happen, Mel, when you're not here? <laughs> I said, I'm just very blessed. You know what it was? It, it was a rattlesnake. I, I, that's a rattlesnake tail sticking out of our wall behind the stucco, trying to crawl into our house. We don't want that in our house. I'm so glad I wasn't there to try to get it out. <laughs> Fortunately, my wife had the presence of mind to call the police. They came out with their animal team, and they had this stick, and they yanked it out. She has it all on video, by the way. Yanked out this snake where the rattlesnake tail is sticking out of the wall. This rattlesnake trying to get into our house. We don't want it there. That's exactly what these councils were doing. We don't want this false teaching, these false gospels in the Word of God, protecting the Word of God. So important. See, inspiration is all about this. God guarantees an accurate recording of his revelation to us by guiding the selection of the very words to be written. Yes, he used the writing style of the authors. He didn't dictate to them what they should write. They wrote in their style, but he guided them along. The Bible says they were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote these words. And by so doing, God was breathing out what he wanted us to to know. I don't believe God was handcuffed in heaven saying, I wish I could get a book to these people that could help them, but I can't. 
But God's not like that. It makes sense that if there's a being out there who took the time to create this planet and humans on it and 400 billion galaxies, that he has enough power to direct the, the formation and production of this awesome book that we hold in our hands. It's so important. Now, there's three words that we need to be aware of. The first is this, when we talk about the inspiration of scriptures, is this, that it's a verbal inspiration. The very words themselves are inspired. The very words themselves are inspired. What is written here? Another key concept is the word plenary, that every part of the Bible, plenary means all, all parts of the Bible are equally inspired. Well, you mean those genealogies in the Old Testament that I got so caught up in, even that's inspired? Yes, exactly. I've had people say to me, maybe you've had it as well, people that have said to me, well, I only believe the red words of the Bible. Have you heard that? Yeah, well, that's good that you believe that, but the same person that spoke the red words of the Bible is the Logos, the living word of God who inspired all all the words of the Bible, all the sections of the Bible. Jesus didn't just show up in Bethlehem. He existed forever and ever, never created. He was the one inspiring the writers as the living Lagos, along with the Holy Spirit. And the other word is this, the inspiration of God's word, that God's word is God-breathed and accurately recorded. So if I asked you today, hey, you believe in the Word of God, that it's the Word of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe it has absolute truth in it? Yes, I do. And I asked you then why, you would say this, because of the manuscript evidence, because of the archaeology that supports it, because of the amazing prophecies. Those are just three of probably six or seven reasons you could use to support your belief that the Word of God is exactly that, the Word of God unique in all of human history. See, the manuscript evidence is powerful. Yeah, as you know, uh, the manuscript evidence has been gathered over years. When the Bible was first written, it, it, what happened was this. Moses realized that when he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, that he needed to make copies of it. So what he did was he went down to the staples down the street and to the Kinko brother, the Kinkos over there, to make copies of it on their copier machine. Is that what he did? Of course not. They didn't have those things back then. What they did is scribes would make copies by hand of every word in God's word. Word by word, page by page. Last week the video mentioned they would count up every letter to make sure the copy matched the number of letters of the original. Count up every word to make sure the words of the copy matched the original. Why? Because this was breathed out by God. They knew that they were dealing with something very, very special that God was involved in the creation of. The printing press didn't come around until 1439. So over the years, thousands of copies were made by hand of God's word. And it's been miraculously preserved. One of the most amazing archaeological finds in all of human history. You probably know what it is, right? 1947. It's referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, approximately 800 50 scrolls were found in caves right near the Dead Sea. I've been there, been to the spot. And what happened was the Qumran community that was living there was trying to keep these manuscripts from being destroyed by the Romans. And they were hid in caves to protect them. And one day, a Bedouin shepherd in 1947 was trying to find out one of his lost sheep. And he took a stone and he threw it into the cave to try to scare out the sheep if it was in there. And when he threw in the stone, he heard a crack. He wondered, what was that? Walked inside and saw containers just like the one you see on the screen that were filled with scrolls. One cave after another, 850 scrolls in total. Virtually every book of the Old Testament, a copy of it or a portion of, a, of that book is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what they found to everyone's amazement was a full copy of the book of Isaiah that dated about 150 B.C., 150 years before Christ. This was amazing 
Because up till this point, the oldest copy they had of the book of Isaiah dated about 950 AD, 950 years after Christ. So this scroll took the manuscript evidence back 1,000 plus years. Skeptics said, oh man, I can't wait till the Isaiah scroll is studied because we'll find out how much the Bible has changed. And I believe it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot in over a thousand years. We're going to find out exactly how much the Bible has changed. In fact, skeptics thought Isaiah 53, the passage that talks about the crucifixion of Christ, like a lamb led to slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. By his stripes we are healed. That passage they believe skeptics did, was added by the early Christian church into the book of Isaiah. Well, when they opened up this scroll dating 150 years before Christ, taking the oldest Isaiah scroll more than a thousand years back, they found that scroll to be virtually identical to the one in 950 AD. No changes made. Awesome preservation of the biblical text because they handled it with such care. See, it was miraculously preserved. The text is incredibly accurate to the original Greek and Hebrew. Uh, scholars use the percentage 98.33% accuracy. That's actually a low number. I have found scholars that have said 99.5% accuracy when it comes to the writing of God's Word. No other book from antiquity compares to it. It doesn't even come close. One half percent that is uncertain in the Bible. Is basically variations in wording or spelling. That picture you see on the screen there, that's a picture of John Ryland's fragment. It's a fragment of the Gospel of John dated about 105, 110, some dated at 100 AD. Ten years after John passed away after writing the book of Revelation in 90 AD. The gap is so small between the writing of the New Testament and the manuscripts that begin to be made as copies are made of God's word. See, the making of these copies, as letters were sent to various churches, they would start making copies of it and distribute it to people. And they would take it to other churches so that people could study what Matthew wrote about, what Mark wrote about, what Luke wrote about, what John wrote about, what Paul wrote about. And those copies were taken all around the Mediterranean world totally thousands of copies, not only in the Greek language, but in other languages as well. And scholars have begun to, begun to find these manuscripts and have these amazing resources to give us the authority to say that the New Testament that we have in our hands is 99% accurate. And if there are uncertainties, it's about word order and spelling. Amazing accuracy in the Word of God. The New Testament has over 5,600 supporting Greek manuscripts. I want you to know this, like when a couple said to me after the 8 o'clock service. They come and said, thank you so much. This is the stuff I need so badly to know because when I share with people I believe in the Bible and I believe in Jesus, they're like, why? why? Why do you believe that? Are you kidding me? This is the stuff I need to tell my friends. I want you to have this ammunition with you when people attack the Word of God. Over 5,600 supporting Greek manuscripts, copies that have been found all around the Mediterranean world and in northern Africa that help us rebuild the original text of the New Testament. Another 20,000 copies. Manuscripts are simply copies, right? In other languages. Some of the manuscripts date to within 15, maybe 10 years of the writing as the New Testament books were completed about 90 AD. Sir Frederick Kenyon, one of the world's leading archaeologists, wrote this. The last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. This amazing scholar said, what you have in your hands is what they wrote when they wrote it. You can be confident of that. No other book in history is like it. I have this chart. It's hard to read, but I thought I'd throw it up there. And there's a list on the right there of the number of manuscripts. Now, remember, probably about 27,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Oh, look at Lucretius on the top. Two manuscripts. 1,100-year gap between the time of Lucretius 
And the earliest manuscript that we have of his writing, if you go down to Aristotle on the bottom, see him way down the bottom, you can hard, hardly see him. It says there, 48 manuscripts. And the gap between Aristotle's life and the oldest manuscript we have of Aristotle's writings, 1,400 years. Yet with just 49 manuscripts and a 1,400-year gap between Aristotle and the oldest manuscript, no scholar questions whether or not we have Aristotle's writings. They're all amazed at how accurate we must have of Aristotle's writings. They don't question it. Now compared to the New Testament, 27,000 manuscripts. A gap from the earliest manuscript ever found of 10, 15 years with the John Ryland's fragment. Nothing else is like it. The book that comes the closest to the Bible from antiquity, anybody know what that book is? Yeah, Homer's Iliad, very good. Homer's Iliad, it was considered sacred, so it was cared for. It had a number of manuscripts, uh, 643 manuscripts, 15,600 lines in Homer's Iliad, 754 lines or 7,640 words are considered questionable, which gives it a 5% accuracy. And scholars are amazed that this manuscript evidence for Homer's Iliad. But now compare it to the New Testament. It's also considered sacred. 5,000 manuscripts in the Greek, 20,000 more in other languages. 20,000 lines in the New Testament. 40 lines or only 400 words are considered to be in question, which gives it a one half percent questionable rating. Much lower than the Iliad. Yet people attack the word of God all the time. Attack its accuracy. Attack its reliability. When the accuracy we have is amazing. Now, I'll throw up the, that slide of the various lines. Let's say you found five different manuscripts of the New Testament. One of the manuscripts said this, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, right? That was a verse that was found in one of the manuscripts. Now, let me ask you this. People have said to me, Mel, there are thousands of, of errors in the Bible. And when I ask them, well, show me one, they can't, right? It's always a good question, an uh, answer to give to that, that question or statement when people say, hey, there's a lot of errors in the Bible. Well, show me one. Throw that question back at them. But if you probe a little deeper, what they mean by that is this. They count every discrepancy between one manuscript and another as an error in the Bible. It's not an error in the Bible. It's an error in the copy. See, when you see this, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world, and you notice the D is missing from the word world, you don't say that's an error in the Bible. It's an error in the copy. The copyist didn't put the D in. You find another manuscript that says Christ Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Well, you notice that the word order has been changed. Christ was put before Jesus. Has the meaning of that statement been changed at all? No, not at all. But people will say, well, there's an error in the Bible because the words were switched. That's not an error in the Bible. That's an error in the manuscript, in the copying. The third manuscript says Jesus Christ, missing the eye, is the Savior of the whole world. The fourth one says Jesus Christ is the, missing the E, Savior of the whole. The whole is missing the word letter O, world. People look at that and say there's another error in the Bible. It's not an error in the Bible. It's an error in the copy. Jesus Christ is the Savior that's misspelled of the whole world. Now, if you had those five manuscripts, could you be pretty confident what the original said? Absolutely you could. If four of the five manuscripts have Jesus Christ, that word order, and only one flipped it, you're pretty certain that the original probably said Jesus Christ because four of the five got it right. And if there are words that are questionable in the New Testament, it deals with these kinds of matters. Should it say Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? What's the word order? Has nothing to do with any theological truth in the Bible. There's no theology that hangs in the balance based on a verse and its questionability. None. Zero. The amazing New Testament and the accuracy of it. That's exactly what these manuscripts have done for us. The original writings were copied into 27,000 manuscripts. 
And from that, we have this amazingly accurate Greek New Testament. Amazingly accurate. Now, people have also said to me, well, the Bible's been changed over the years. Because, for example, take the English Bible. In 1611, they wrote the King James Version. Then people took the King James Version and said, well, I don't really like that. I'm going to write the New King James Version. So they looked at the King James and changed what they didn't like in the New King James Version. And then people took the New King James Version, and then they wrote the American Standard Version and said, well, I don't like what the New King James says. I'm going to write the American Standard. Then they wrote the New American Standard. Then they took the New American Standard and wrote the New International Version. See, they wrongly assume that there's this linear progression of versions, that the new King James was used to write the American Standard, that the American Standard was then used to write the new American Standard. That's wrong. See, what happened is from the Greek New Testament, groups of scholars came together and put together all the major versions that are out there today. Scholars coming together who love the Word of God, who are, who are experts in the Greek, they want to stay true to what it says, and they translate these versions from the original Greek. It's not this sequential, you know, one book changing after another. That's not how it happened. All of them translated out of the Greek New Testament into more modern-day English. If you read the King James Version, you realize, hey, the English language has changed quite a bit from 1611. So let's have a version of it. In modern-day English, I have the English Standard Version. If you know Greek, you'll be amazed at how accurate the English Standard Version is. One reason why I like to uh, preach from this Bible and not, for example, a paraphrase is because I know this is so true to the original Greek. I've compared verses with the, my Greek New Testament. I'm like, wow, they just it's like translated word for word. Amazing accuracy. So don't let people say that all of these versions of the Bible have changed the Bible. That is not accurate. They have no conception of the manuscript evidence for the Bible. They have no conception of how all these translations came into existence. It's very important. And as I close, I just want to begin by talking about archaeology. People have said to me, and they'll say it to you if you talk to them about archaeology, people have said this to me many times. Archaeology has proven the Bible to be false. You will hear that if you talk about the truthfulness and accuracy of the Bible. The problem is nothing could be further from the truth. They either assume that or someone has wrongly said it. But when you talk to archaeological scholars, they will tell you again and again how amazed they are at the accuracy of the Bible. Dr. Nelson Gluck, one of the most influential and famous archaeologists of all time wrote this about the Bible. No archaeological discovery has ever controverted or contradicted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. When I was in Israel, my tour guide was involved in an amazing dig I asked him, what was the highlight of your archaeological career? He said, being involved in what's known as the Pontius Pilate inscription. In 1961, he was there in Caesarea and uncovered this stone that had this inscription on it, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. Up until 1961, no reference to Pontius Pilate had been found outside of the New Testament writings, and people would mock it. They would say, oh, Pontius Pilate, oh, that's just something, some person the, uh, the, the gospel writers made up. There's no Pontius Pilate until this stone was found, dating back to the time of Christ when Pontius Pilate was prefect of Judea. Many others, hundreds of others. I'll just give you this list. The stone pavement that John mentions in John 19 found, the pool of Bethesda found, Jacob's well found, the pool of Siloam found, the ancient cities of Bethlehem, Nazareth, Canaan. Capernaum was mocked. People said there was no city named Capernaum up by Galilee until it was found. And then the city of Chorazin. The residence of Pilate in Jerusalem was later found. All of these are just some of the hundreds of archaeological findings that have supported God's word. It's amazing. It's truly awesome. 
And one after one, these archaeological findings prove the Bible to be incredibly accurate. Now you might say, well, Mel, isn't that normal for uh, sacred writings to have that kind of accuracy? Well, let me compare it, for example, to the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is considered a religious text. There's a statement regarding the Book of Mormon in the Smithsonian Institute. They have eight statements about it, all undermining the accuracy of the Book of Mormon. This is one statement that they have. It says this. Could you go to the next slide? The Smithsonian Institute has never used the Book of Mormon in any way as a scientific guide. Smithsonian archaeologists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of this book. See, the Book of Mormon is all about the Mormons' belief that Jesus Christ appeared to Central American Indians and that there was a war between these warring groups and factions in Central America trying to protect the Book of Mormon. No city mentioned in the Book of Mormon has ever been found in Central America, ever. The Smithsonian scholars say they see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of this book. Go to the next one. Therefore, there is a consensus from professional archaeologists, Mormon and non-Mormon alike, that there is no specific confirmation of the Book of Mormon from archaeology. See, it's not unique. It is unique, I'm sorry, for the Bible to have this amazing archaeological evidence. It's not common for books of antiquity to have the kind of support the Bible has. It's just another piece of evidence for the amazing production of God's Word. And I'm going to go over more next week. This will be my last week talking about it, but I want you to have this evidence. And more than that, you know, when I was studying this week, I was reminded of a verse that is in the New Testament. Jesus had people come to him and say, Hey, Jesus, didn't we... Uh, perform miracles in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name and prophesy in your name. Amazing things. They did mighty works and prophesy and cast out demons and perform miracles. Jesus' answer to them was, depart from me, I never what? I never knew you. And as important as it is to have this head knowledge in your mind to defend the word of God, more importantly is to know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That you've put your faith and trust in Him. That there is an ongoing relationship that you have with Him. That you know Jesus, which fires you up to get the evidence to support this amazing book that God has given to us, unique in all history. Nothing else like it, miraculously preserved by God so that we can live our lives for Him. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. And as your heads are bowed today, my prayer would be that all of you would say, Lord, I, I want to know you more. I want my faith to be bolstered by the evidence for our faith. And I want to draw near to you, Jesus. I can't remember the last time I prayed to you. I talked to you from my heart. I can't remember the last time I wrote, read the word of God for the sheer enjoyment of it. May we as a church draw near to Jesus so that we'll hear, instead of, depart from me, I never knew you. We will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we love you today. Pray that as we leave this place, we would be bolstered in our faith, that we would be ready to give the evidence that backs up what we believe. So this small step of faith that we take to believe in you, to believe that you exist and that you gave us this amazing word, it's a very small step of faith. Lord, we love you today. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Get the sign-ups. We have elders up front who love to pray with you. And live this week? All for him. God bless you. See you on the patio.